From 1980 to early 1983, no one dominated the charts like Air Supply. While stringing together a series of top 10 hits, including a number one single, they carved out a reputation as one of the best live rock bands around. After decades of successful albums and sold-out concerts, they are back on the road celebrating their 46th year as a touring band. In a very open and candid conversation with the lead singer of Air Supply, the incomparable Russell Hitchcock, we discussed stories from the road, former bandmates, and more. As for me, I got the chance to interview my idol. This is my exclusive and unedited conversation with Russell Hitchcock. Hi, everybody. This is Russell Hitchcock. You're listening to 99 WNRR. Close your eyes. I want to ride the skies in my sweet dreams. How are you? I'm great, man. Nice to see you. Same, same. (laughs) Um, You're doing good, though. Well, you know, in spite of the the, uh, obvious, we were off the road for 10 months. Uh, We finished last March. We did our first shows this year in Florida a couple of weeks ago, and now we're back off the road again until the end of April, which really sucks. I mean, it's incredible. Um, I did catch the show on Valentine's Day. Oh, you did? Yes, of course. Oh, good. Great show. Great show. Um, How did that feel, being off the road for 10 months? I mean, you guys have been road warriors. Yeah, 1981, Homedale, New Jersey, first concert ever. Put it well, there. Oh God. All right. So, uh, what did that feel like? I mean, you got you got you have been on the road, you know, for yeah, yeah. now 46 years. So, Correct. what did it feel like after 10 months of finally getting back to it? Well, from my perspective, um, I mean, we rehearsed for five days before the first show. Um, but I was terrified. I mean, I get stage fright every night without fail. And uh, to get back out there, you know, in front of an audience, no matter how many people were there, was terrifying to me. And, I, you know, in fact, I watched uh, uh, I watched the live stream thing and I just thought to myself, you look really nervous and scared and awkward. And um, thankfully, my voice was in good shape. So that's all that really matters. You know? True. Yeah. Yeah. Um- What is it, what does it mean to you? I mean, 46 years, both personally and professionally Mm -hmm. to be doing it uh, in this business for, you know, that long uh, period of time. Well, um, I I think the first thing is that, I mean, air supply has always been not cool and um, underrated, especially Graham as a songwriter. I can't believe he's never been nominated for a Grammy, even for songwriting. Apart from any, you know, anything. Um, and for the last maybe 10 years, we're starting to get some respect from the, uh, the not fake media. Um, and that feels good, you know, because, I mean, as you said, we, we've worked on the road every year since 1975 without a break. Uh, we stopped recording for a bit and people thought we'd broken up, but we still toured and we you know, obviously we still do. And to be able to maintain the, the, the concerts at the level that we perform um, after all this time, of course, we have, you know, incredible musicians. Um, you know, we hire young, good looking guys, so they make us look good. And um, I mean, it's just an achievement, you know, I mean, I, I can, Honestly, say well. I don't know who. Maybe the Stones, uh, America, who are good friends of ours. Um, Aerosmith, maybe. I don't know. How, um, you could probably name on one hand bands that, that have been around as long as we have, and are still performing at that kind of level. Original members. You know, I think through this time, you know, I'm. You know, some people forget that Air Supply, first and foremost, is a rock band. Now, with that being said, every single year that you guys have gone out, every single year since the 80s, you guys have added something to the live arrangements of the classic songs. Yeah. And when I heard this new arrangement on this current tour, um, I re- it reminded me of the Earth Is Tour, the changes you made, and also the Vanishing Race Tour, some of the changes that you made to the arrangements. Two times in a row, I went back to back with... Um, I think it was Homedale. It was the Art Center. And then you played Music Fest in Bethlehem, uh, Pennsylvania. And I actually played soccer with your 
uh, road crew for a little bit because <laughs> we were there. They were, they were having fun on a break. Um, but every time you guys, you would kind of add something to the arrangement. This time, I was blown away by the new arrangements. They're so much heavier sonically. And Pavel, wow. It's, yeah. uh, he, he reminds me, and his fluidity kind of reminds me of a, like a little bit more of a metal Ralph Cooper. His oh, yeah, fluidity yeah, yeah. is the same. You know what I mean? He's, he's insane. I mean, I don't, um, with Mirko and Pavel, um, I didn't meet them before they played with us. Um, Aaron, who's a monster guitar player, obviously, um, he's responsible for a lot of a, a lot of the changes in the arrangements. Wow! And you know, he's the term musical director, which he is for the band. Um, that's what, that's what he does. And also, Graham has been adamant that every year that we go out, that we don't want to be a, a nostalgia act. You know. We want to bring bring something new to the table. We always play a couple of new songs in the show every year, um, and we want to stay current. Um, so com- those combinations, I think. Plus, you know, Mirko is a brilliant pianist. Um, he brings his influence to the arrangements. Pavel obviously has kicked it up quite a notch um, with the way he plays and his taste. You know, mm, yeah. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a heavy guy, but he, he complements our music tremendously. You know. So it's, I think it's those things to, to have people that bring a fresh approach every year and to, you know, every tour is something that, uh, you know, we value tremendously because otherwise we would be, you know, here I am, you love me. here we go again. <laughs> exactly. I hear, no, I hear you. Um, you guys have had the most amazing players in the band. And I think what, you know, I'm thinking back to the classic lineup, you know, the Rex Go, the David Moises, the David Greens, Frank Esler Smith, God bless him. And of course, Ralph Cooper. Um, and, uh, you know, you were coming out of Lost in Love through the one that you love. And of course, Now and Forever. Was there any um, idea of trying to keep that uh, lineup together? Because I know that, you know, when you got to the 84 tour all of a sudden here comes wally stocker from the babies yeah so all right was there every kind of was there any thought back then to you know say you know this, this is a great band let's like keep this whole thing together or was it that you wanted to evolve you know we never expected to lose anybody quite frankly um however we were managed by don arden for, for a bit who managed black sabbath and ozzy and elo and uh, he he's a yeah. I mean, if you re- read anything about him, he was a character. Um, and he said to us, you know, you guys need something different now mm. if you're going to move forward. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not telling you, but I'm suggesting that you look for, you know, a bit of spark, a bit of fire, a bit more aggression, um, because otherwise you'll just, you'll, he didn't say you'll just be, he said you'll be, you know, and, um, we took that to heart and we, we, made, we, we made some tough choices because ideally, you know, I loved uh, the guys in the band. Um, I'm, I still keep in touch with David uh, occasionally on Facebook mm-hmm. and Rex. Um, obviously Frank was very responsible for the early arrangements, all the strings and all, you know, basically vocal, a lot of vocal arrangements. Um, the Ralph won't talk to me anymore for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but, you know, we had to move on and we did. And, and uh, you know, we, we had players that we, we liked for a period, but it's not just a player that plays well. They've got to fit in with, 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 the, with the band and the crew and the public and gate agents and waitresses and waiters and everybody. Because once, and I've said this to the guys every, every uh, go around, I said, when you leave the house, you're on my dime. Mm. That's the bottom line. Until you get back home you're on my dime. So you better represent us to the best of your ability and be polite and kind and all that stuff. Because, and I said, if you guys screw it up, you can go somewhere else. You can quit the band or get fired and join somebody else. Graham and I can't. This is us. This is our, I had to use the word brand, but this is our brand and this is what people expect from us. And we expect the same from you. So, you know, it's a tough uh, juggling act, you know, 
Yeah, I, I completely understand that. I mean, especially with, you know, what you guys, you know, were known for in the public. I mean, to sit there and, and I think it was a mandate that everybody in the, the, the band, the corporation, so to speak, um, you know, carry themselves a certain way. Correct. Of course it does. I mean, um, we were certainly in the 80s, we, we were no angels, but we didn't, uh, we didn't, we, we didn't go to the right parties. We didn't get arrested for throwing TVs through windows or doing cocaine or any of that stuff. You know, our, our, our choice was probably a few too many cocktails. That was it. But, um, you know, that's, that's our, that was our business privately. And I think probably we suffered a bit from not being, you know, uh, semi bad boys, you know? Yeah. I mean, I guess what the, you know, the general media and what they decided to do to you guys and, and the stigma, you know, that they put upon you guys, which to me, I thought was, you know, unfair. 46 years later, what is still the, the favorite song that you can't wait to get to in the set list? Um, my two favorites are lost in love and all out of love by far, you know, lost in love changed our life. When it was released in the U S it changed our life lives overnight. It took, it took a long time to get to the U S but when it did, that was, you know, that was the beginning of, of everything for us. Um, all out of love is just, you know, it's, it's our anthem. It's our, whatever you want to call it. Mm. And it's the most requested song during the show. People yell it out all the time. Still. Um, and it's a you know it's a classic, and we typically finish the show with it because once you play that, there's, you can't play anything else. That's you know, <laughs> that's the end. Um, I mean, of course, uh, but I do remember a time though when you guys ended with I think it was in the eighties in those tours. You ended a lot of shows with "My Heart Belongs to Me," uh, which had a real rock and ending to it. Um, what was there a song that you guys? didn't think had a chance and then all of a sudden you were like wow um two of them even the nights are better because graham and i we didn't want to record it in the first place because we thought it sounded like the theme from martha <laughs> after he does as he pleases even the nights are better you know and um but but clive in his infinite wisdom said it's going to be released so get over it <laughs> and the other one was uh two less lonely people i didn't care for that in the first instance, oh. um, because uh, uh, this coming from air supply guy, I thought it was really corny. <laughs> but um, you know, once again, uh, the more successful songs become, the more you like them. That's true. That's true. I, I always found that the sweet spots on the records. You know, I think about l the one that you love, side two. Of course, you got sweet dreams on it. Um, but all the other songs on that side as well are just classics. You know, I've got your love tonight. Just uh, staples. Are you familiar with um, Never Fade Away? That's oh yeah, of course. One of my favorites, actually, um, off of the '85 self-titled release, I believe. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, that's off the '85 self-titled release, isn't it? Um, I don't know. You know that. Is, it, is, it, is it that one? There you go. One of my. One walking along the boulevard, yeah, yeah, one of my favorite songs. Period. And um, we were in England recording with Peter Collins, who's quite a you know legendary guy too. Yeah. And uh, we we recorded the song, and I thought it sounded great. And at the end, I think there are two or three key changes. And uh, and Peter said after the first one, "Do you want to try another one?" I said, "Okay, whatever." And then, do you want to try another one? And I went, "Okay." And it was a stretch, but I think it sounds one of one of the best vocals I've done, in my opinion, and, uh, a, and a song that and a song that was uh, overlooked certainly. Oh, I would agree. Uh, one of your best vocal performances ever, if not your very best vocal performance. I just love soaring choruses that just take you, you know, to new heights. And uh, I don't recall if that was played live i remember i was there i was there for the 86 tour in one of your one or more probably maybe awkward moments live i actually knew the person where you had an awkward non-kiss moment <laughs> uh i'm gonna jog your memory uh it was that tour it was a self-titled release tour you were in homedale uh which you guys played like so many times uh yeah, like a yeah. favorite place 
Uh, and there was a woman sitting in the front row who went up for a, like, you know, the ceremonial kiss when you're singing to her and you got right. down right there and she said, no, put her hands up and shook your hand and she <laughs> went back to her seat. I knew that woman. <laughs> really? I did. I know her name. I know where she lives still, but I knew that woman. Yeah. She was That's like, funny. God bless her. <laughs> I was like, cause her husband was sitting right there. That's why. <laughs> I, I, I got you. Okay. <laughs> oh man. Uh, talk about, I was bringing one back 46 years in this business. Um, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen in the industry? The biggest what? Some of the biggest changes in this industry. Uh, it went from creativity to money, to, to supporting a new act, to um, if you don't have a hit out of the box, you're gone. It's become disposable music to me. Not that there's anything wrong with making it in your bathroom, but you can do it. Anybody can do it. Do it. <laughs> True. I actually said that this morning on a morning show. This is a very, very same thing, actually. Um and, you know, for all the hard work through the years that you guys have put into being one of the quintessential live bands, I mean, there are very, very few bands that are as uh, tight as you guys. What do you think when you see some of these bands that are out there that are starting out brand new bands and absolutely performing or dancing or whatever doing and just completely playing to tracks. What does that mean? What do you, what do you think when you, all this hard work that you did through the years? You and, know, sorry. Go ahead. What, what, is, what, is, what does that say to you when you see something like that and you know that they're, they're, they're singing the tracks? Well, you know, I don't, uh, I don't judge anybody seriously because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm part of a generation that obviously doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> and, um, you know, once again, I'm proud of what we've done. I'm proud of our legacy that, that's going to be, for my kids, kids, kids to listen to. Um, and I get asked uh, in interviews, who do you listen to today? And I go, well, today I listen to the Beatles, the Queen, the Bee Gees, uh, the Eagles, ACDC, the, and they're my go-tos. And I don't listen to new music because I don't care for it. Okay. And, and also I'm not a musical guy. I mean, Graham listens to current stuff because I think he wants to – you know, see what's out there and maybe, you know, see what would, would influence him now. But I don't write songs. I mean, I, I couldn't write a song if you paid me. So I have no kind of reference to new things. I just, and I don't like them. I mean, I, I, I buy a T-shirt and I wear it till it falls off my body. I buy a pair of jeans until I, I can't wear them anymore. You know, I don't like new things except my, my one um uh, <clears throat> I guess fault or passion is jewelry. I'll buy stuff all the time that I don't need. But I like shiny new things too. In, in and, tattoos. and tattoos. And tattoos. Uh, yeah. And tattoos. Yeah. Fact, I'm getting another one tomorrow night. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So um I thought I would do this. Now I haven't done this with anybody, but considering that, you know, knows a lot of research and, and a lot about your career. I uh, just want to get your thoughts on some classic albums. And if I haven't done this yet, first thing that comes in your mind. Ready? Yep. One of the greatest singers of all time. Obviously, we were lucky enough to tour with him in 77. Great guy. A rock star. Max rock star. Now, obviously, with the faces and, you know, legendary for parties, you know, the quintessential party yeah, band. Yeah. Uh, what did you guys learn uh, touring with him? Well, what we learned from Rod was uh, how to present yourself on stage, how to um, interact with an audience, how to, I don't mean this in a bad way, how to control what they feel during the show. Um, you know, it, it's not just a show for us. It has a beginning and a middle and an, and an ending that, that is supposed to work separately but, you know, in accordance with each other. We learned about production. We learned about lights. We learned about sound. We learned about the business side of things. We learned about, well, we, we got our punctuality from uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. We learned about punctuality and treating people well. He taught us a whole bunch of stuff. We watched every show 
I think we did 60 shows with him. We watched every show without 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 missing one because every time you watched it, you, you saw something different or something new. And he was a tremendous influence on what we do, certainly. Oh, agreed. Um, actually saw that tour and also Dynamite uh, tour uh, in 1988, two and a half hours, uh, jaw dropping the energy that he had, you know, and uh, a few subsequent tours after that when he was having his vocal trouble and, yep. uh, you know, he was a trooper and, you know, he just muscled through the entire show. Um, well, you know, you're pulling out the, the mega stars. Great, great, great players. Great, all of them are great records. I have a, a Robert Plant story. Um, we were in India. We got some, a VH1 award for being the most fab band ever or something, whatever it was, all for that year. And we played a football stadium with uh, Robert Plant, um, Brian May and Roger Taylor from Queen, Brian Adams, um, who else was on the bill, the Macarena people, um, a whole bunch of acts. And I, uh, it was all, it was in a football stadium, like 50,000 people. And I walked backstage with my, you know, garment bag and my boot bag over my shoulder. And it was all um, pipe and drape for people that don't know. That's not proper dressing rooms. It's just curtains. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I was walking down the corridor or down this place and I saw Robert Plant and uh, surrounded by 20 reporters with microphones in his face. And I freaked out because I'm a fan before I'm anything, you know. So I went to walk past and I was trying to do like a outside circle to part, you know, and he actually stopped uh, the thing and he said, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, or excuse me. And he put his hand out and he said, I'm Robert Plant. It's a pleasure to meet you. That's class. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, who knew yeah. that he knew? <laughs> this one's going to throw you. Okay, ready? Here you go. I don't get it. I don't, I don't, I don't get kissed, you know. I mean, God bless them. I never, uh, I'm never jealous of success or begrudge it. And they're one of the most successful bands of all time. One of the, one of the greatest uh, self-marketing bands of all time. Um, genius at that, but you know, I, I don't get it. Sorry, Gene. And Gen- genius at that. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I got one more for you. I don't want to do this too much, but how about this one? Um, apart from the cover, I think it's one of the best albums that I've ever heard. Well, in those days with Arista, their um, art, department or whatever they wanted to call it was um, because we were new. We didn't have a clue. And Clive was the boss. We knew that. And um, they would say, do you want this balloon or that balloon? Do you want a paraglider or a parasailer? That one there. Yeah. yeah. And of course um, we, we said, we don't want those. They don't. And that's one of the reasons why in early days and still now people don't know they don't know who the faces are with their supply. They know the songs, but they don't know who Graham and I are. And I'm, I'm fine with that. I always was. But it used to bug me so bad when we had meetings about what would you like, this one or that one. In fact, they, uh, they sent their artwork to Japan for the early albums. And the early Japan albums were all uh, hand-drawn, parasailers or paragliders or whatever. Mm. And when we first went to Japan, you know, we said, can we see the album? Yeah. Oh God, not, not another one. And um, then they, they, uh, Japan, uh, Arista in Japan uh, nicknamed us, nicknamed us the peppermint sound. Peppermint sound. Which we hated, of course, because we were, we thought we were a rock and roll band. Um, But, you know, you, you can't fight City Hall. I've learned that a long time ago. True. Until you are until you are the mayor, then you can do whatever you want. You want. That's, that's very true. Um, I know that uh, time's short, and I don't want to spend you know too much of your time. Okay. As long as you want, dude. This is a pleasure and different. So thank you. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. Um, 
You know, covering the... Um, is there any one of the songs that you wish you could do differently, whether, ra- I mean, even though you rearrange it live, was there, is there anything like you wish, you know, I'd like to take a crack at that song again or something like that? I have to tell you, um, and this is honest, honestly, there isn't a song in the show that I don't love to sing every night or be involved with whatever, whatever I'm doing in the song. And I think that's a testament uh, to mostly Graham's songwriting but all the songs, they've, they stand the test of time and they sound as good today if you hear them on the radio or whatever as they did then. And I don't ever go, God, here we go again. I never do that because we've, we've put, taken songs in and out over the years, given, given them a rest. Some don't come back, some do. Um, but I can honestly say, you know, I, I wouldn't change our show right now. We have two new songs in the show now called um, It's a Beautiful story and uh, i believe in love love and uh, they're both great songs they are i look forward to them too i mean i love singing uh without you because it's a major classic song and we did a great version of it i think um i love singing even the nights are better now and i love singing two less lonely people because i've grown to love them um not because they were successful per se but because i love the songs they touch me every night, and that's honest. You know what? A lot of people don't know is why. Well, you know, one of my favorite songs that you used to do live, "I Can Wait Forever," right. off a of Ghostbuster soundtrack. Classic. That yeah. you can find? Love that song, and that you know, obviously, we're Airheads, which you know, some of these, some of these classics ones. "Innocent Eyes" was another one, obviously, I think, written by Graham Nash because he recorded it, but you guys did a great job with it. You used to do it live, I think, on the 84 tour, and as well uh, as uh, Late Again. Yeah. yeah. To, to bring that back again. We've talked about um, bringing I Can Wait Forever back in the show, um, but I'm going to write down Late Again after we hang up because uh, that's a great, great song. And, you know, it's a rock and roll song and it's balls to the wall. And for us, it's great. I, exactly. I mean, that to me, that was the part of the show where you could really cut loose and you really saw the rock and roller in you. Um, the other one, I can't get excited that that could be another one. Um, yeah. Some of the classic ones that had you guys really rocking out. I would love to see some of those, you know, ones that were fan favorites that, you know, just had great response. Uh, I would love to see them brought back. Definitely. Definitely late mm-hmm. again. Ted, tell Graham. Somebody told me late again today because that that was a lot of fun. That that track. Was- I'll write that down. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, be safe. First and foremost, be safe on this tour, please, and uh, take you care too, take care of yourself. And uh, when you get to, uh, I know that you're going to be at the Music Box, and uh, I'll hopefully maybe get a chance to connect with you. It'd be good to do that. Uh, right. Playing Atlantic City, but otherwise, uh, it's been an honor to. Uh, Talk to my idol for a while. Thank Thank you. This has been been a real treat for me, you know, because obviously one never knows what you're going to get with interviewers or interviewees. Well, anyway, you don't you don't know what to expect. This has been a pleasure, and and drop me a note. I'd love to keep in touch with you. Uh, I would love that. Thank you so much. All right, Michael. All right. You be safe. To have a great day, and um, once again, it was a real pleasure. Same with me. Take care. Be safe, man. Peace. Peace. Bye. Bye.